closing remarks tonight. Our vision has finally become a reality. Our commitment to amplifying Ukraine's voice on the global stage, particularly the voice of the new generation, has culminated in the first ever Ukraine House in Davos at the World Economic Forum. I'm proud to be a board member and Horizon Capital founding member of the Ukrainian Venture Capital and Private Equity Association, the organizer of the Ukraine House. Thank you to our partners, Western NS Enterprise Fund, Viktor Pinchuk Foundation, as well as to sponsors IT Ukraine, Siklem, and the many panel sponsors who made Ukraine House possible. Thank you to the President of, of Ukraine, Petro Poroshenko, to the Presidential Administration, the National Investment Council of Ukraine, and Ukraine Invest for your support and contribution. I will keep my remarks short tonight. As the event is to enable investors to hear directly from Petro Poroshenko, President of Ukraine, and Sir Suma Chakrabarti, President of the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, Ukraine's largest investor, with over 12 million euros in cumulative investments to date, and a champion for strong corporate governance and reforms that improve the investment climate of Ukraine. Following our keynote addresses, we will open the floor to questions, then you will have an opportunity to interact with top officials in Ukraine. We have with us tonight the Vice Prime Minister for European and Euro Atlantic Integration, Ivana Klimpish Sensadze. Ivana? Ivana. <laughs> the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Pavlo Klimkin. <laughs> the Minister of Finance, Alexander Daniluk. Minister of Infrastructure, Volodymyr Omelian. Head of the National Investment Council, Yulia Kovalev. And Director of Ukraine Invest, Dan Bielak. In closing, I will share with you how I respond to hundreds of investors who ask me, tell me in a snapshot what has changed in Ukraine over these years. I show them one slide. Ukraine's rise in doing business ranking since 2012 relative to emerging economies that they invest in, relative to, for example, Brazil, India, Argentina. In 2012, Ukraine was at number 152, well below all three of these countries. In just over five years, Ukraine has risen 76 points and exceeds all of these countries, with India the closest at 100. In 2013, Ukraine was number 71 in the Global Innovation Index, again, well below India, Argentina, and Brazil. In just four short years, Ukraine has risen 21 points to number 50, with India at 60 and Argentina at 76. This is a slide that every investor that, I've, that I meet with is very impressed with because this represents thousands of hours, hundreds of reforms, and the collective effort of all branches of the Ukrainian government. I am proud of Ukraine's brains, hands, and grains and I invite you to see for yourself what the country has to offer. Mr. President, the floor is yours. Thank you, Elena. Thank you, all of you. Sorry for those who are standing outside of the building, not having an opportunity to be together with us. This is just to uh, stress how popular is these events. And uh, I think I'm really happy. I'm happy for the fact that first time in many, many years, we have Ukrainian House Davos. And, and not simply Ukrainian House Davos, but with the slogan, creativity, innovation, opportunity. This is the best characteristics now has Ukraine. And I want to thank, of course, I can thank sponsors. This is very important. I can thank uh, to representative of the presidential administration who work. But I want to thank enthusiasts who come here, who strongly believe in Ukraine, and who think that this is the most important thing for them now to be here and to deliver the information about Ukraine. How Ukraine changed 
And this is not only the few figures which mention Olena. This is nothing similar. And this is not only the changes of the legislation. This is the first year when this legislation starts to be implemented and work. And this is the independent estimation about our 76 place in rating of doing business. And if you ask me, am I, am I happy? No. I'm absolutely confident that within a short period of time, we would be in the first 50. This is absolutely realistic because our team are together, we work hard, and we do a lot of things which happening after rating was finished. I am proud, again, that we make very important reform of the pension sector, pension reform, which make our financial system, budget system healthier, and which would be much more stable and predictable, the situation in Ukraine. Can you imagine that three years ago we have a 15% budget deficit? 60% now below 3%. Maybe it would be below 2% this year. <laughs> Spending 6% on the security of defense and defense expenditure because we are a country in a state of war. And all this reform happens during the war. When we defend in our sovereignty, defend in our uh, territorial integrity, defend in our independence. We clean up banking system. The banking system now are healthy, which not happened never since crisis 97 or crisis 2007. We very much afraid to mention the figures of the non-performant loans. Now, we think that we do enormous things. We have a macro financial stability, but <coughs> the most important thing we do during the last half a year, education reform, health care reform, very unpopular, but we should be a leader, not a populist. And this is our difference. Because populists never bring the country to the positive results. We make an important steps on cybersecurity. We make a very important step on the rural medicine. 14 million of Ukrainians now will have an access to the modern medical services. Can you imagine that when I was elected as the president, Ukraine don't have 3G mobile uh, communication standard? No. Because of the corruption. In, in a few days, it seems to be on the 29th of 31st. Okay, let's check who is right. Uh, let's say 31st of January, we will have opening the envelope for the 4G communication standard. And we have a lot of companies who plan to participate and to invest the money. The very good characteristic that this year I have more than 80 companies request top leaders, world leaders. 80 companies request for the meeting with me during one day. This is a very good characteristic, not an advertising, about how popular Ukraine now for the investment and how strongly believe these people in our success. I'm proud that we have a new privatization law. It's not yet signed because they, they try to block it in the parliament that they attempt to stop the reforms. We don't allow them even tiny chance with using the Anglo Brit England and Wales uh, legal system for those investors who wants to sign a uh, contract in this system with the obligatory participation of the foreign advisors with the absolutely transparent position no any more special competition which is a symbol of the corruption it would be transparent privatization which 
we demand to launch now, immediately. And I'm absolutely confident that that will be successful. We plan to make it, not to stop them, to make uh, changes in the tax legislation. I insist and I invite uh, both business association, our advisors, including advisors from EBRD, and I kindly thank uh, President Chakrabarti for many things he do for my country, as a, not only as a, uh, the financing institution, but as an advisor for the reform. His role is extremely important together with the World Bank, IMF, IFC, and others. And we plan to change corporate profit tax to the distributed profit tax, not the investment in Ukraine, reinvestment of the profit should be zero taxation. That is a very strong motivation to increase the number of the investment in the Ukrainian economy. We need an economic growth. And 2.5% economic growth, which was demonstrated in Ukraine during the first six months of year 2017, is not enough. And I'm confident that in the year 2018, it should be more than 3.5%. And that would be growing. We should we create the National Bureau for the uh, Financial Security. Let's say, have this name. But that means that it would be only analytic and no any more any law enforcement agency to have a right to touch the business. I launched before end of the year the reform, second phase of the reform of the court system, judicial reform. <coughs> we now have an absolutely new Supreme Court. We launched that it would be not anymore so-called Pechersky or Solominsky court legislation. It would be, we are waiting the new people to come and to help us to build up the society of justice. And uh, many other things. Today it was discussion if the glass is half empty or <laughs> half full. I have a new version. And I hope that Mr. President support me. The glass is not half anymore. We have bigger. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that this is extremely important message for those. Please, not wasting the time, not waiting June, July, August, autumn. It's right time and right place today to be in Davos, in Ukrainian House Davos, but already the day after tomorrow. Tomorrow, maybe to listen to the US president, <laughs> but the day after tomorrow, please be in Ukraine. We are waiting for you, we are waiting investors, we are confident, we create an enormous efforts to create a best, in, uh, which we can, investment climate. And this is very important that together with me now, our ministers, <coughs> which uh, are the team who wants to build up uh, the new Ukraine. And Ukraine now is different. You can come and be sure of that. And one of the persons to whom I want to especially thank to be a co-author, co-sponsor of this reform, person who strongly believes in Ukrainian potential, is the president of the EBRD, a very good friend of mine, very good friend of Ukraine, Sumo Chakrabarti. President, for is yours. Lena, sorry that I take your role for presentation. <laughs> that's fine, that's fine. <laughs> well, thank you very much, everyone. I hope you can all hear me. Um, and good evening to you all. Very difficult to follow my friend Petro after that uh, ringing endorsement. Petro, can I say one thing? I'm going to call you Petro. I know Please. I call you Mr. President of the Alpha now for so long. We start, to we start to have a success when Sumo start to call me Petro. <laughs> 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 I'll tell you one thing, though. You do need to get a bigger house. <laughs> 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 I sell out crowd here, standing room only. So I think next time round, we'll put you across the street. <laughs> 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 There's a very famous uh, British uh, TV program from the 70s. Uh, you can say that. I possibly I, I could have <laughs> 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 But look, 
Um, it's always an honor to speak at these investment panels, but for me, this one is more emotional <coughs> than usual. And uh, for the reason Mr. President said, um, I became EBRD president some five and a half years ago. And we were lending a lot to Ukraine in those days, too. But we were very unhappy, frankly. When we first met in Tokyo, we talked frankly about that. It was in the dying days of the previous regime. And a, a wake-up moment for me was when one of your best agribusiness companies came to me in, a, in a Istanbul conference we were having with the FBI Yeah, yeah, yeah. And talked about the corporate raiding and the interference they had to face every day. Most of the manager at the time was taken up dealing with these raids and not actually <coughs> run the business. And it was a company that we invest in, we're still investing in as well today. I then went in February 2013 and made what I think was an unusual thing for a, for a multilateral president to do, to go on TV live in Ukraine and criticize the government to their face. That is not something we are taught to do. We don't usually try and do that. But we have just had enough. And we decided at that point to only invest in, in the private sector, not do public sector. Then the Maidan events came and things changed. And things changed for the better. I was at Vilnius when those events <coughs> happened and the whole EU approximation process Me around too. the whole. You were there too. You were both angry, fed up. Uh, and so for me, this has become very personal. I have uh, traveled to every single, Phil and I both have traveled to every single country of operations of EBRD. But, you know, in the case of Ukraine, I've made 10 visits in five and a half years. <coughs> there for roughly every six months. I joke with you that maybe I should actually just rent an apartment because there's a lot of people <laughs> EBRD that are paying all their hotel bills in Ukraine. Um, but that's because I honestly, honestly believe that this was a moment in history, a real chance for the new leadership of the country to really change the dial. And I think the numbers you read out on the Doing Business Survey say that. And now as we head towards the first of the new Foreign Investors Council, now is the moment to speak frankly about some of that change. And for me, it's a story of courage. You cannot modernize and reform a country without taking on vested interests. And that's very, very difficult in any country. But given the history of Ukraine, it was doubly difficult, in my view. And given the capability in the public administration, doubly difficult to implement things as well. So I pay a lot of tribute to the president, to the prime ministers we've worked with, to all the ministers, Alexander, who's been a wonderful friend of ours, comrade, uh, governor for EBRD as well. So I have to see him a lot. But all the other ministers too, as a team. <coughs> I think this is the team that we really try to work with, and we have very, very frank conversations <coughs> of the sort we are not able to have with many other countries because of that relationship that opens. Now we are, as you said at the beginning, of the, we are the biggest uh, investor <coughs> in Ukraine. We've invested actually 12 billion euros okay. uh, over the years, um, but a very large proportion of that has been in the last few years, and I'll come to that as to why. I think we were founded, as you all probably know, to really push the market-based economy, to move away from state planning to run an effective market economy. Back in 1991, we thought the market economy was just making it a bit more competitive, really, so it could uh, you know, improve its sales into Western Europe. So we've understood a lot more about the market economy since then, and we have moved our understanding much greater. One of the biggest things, and again I pay tribute to Phil and his colleagues, is to integrate investment and policy work much more closely. In the past, the conversations we used to have in Ukraine, pre-Maidan, were about policy reforms that might make it easier for us and our investment, but not necessarily actually making a bigger difference across the sector and across the economy. That's completely changed. Two examples. One is the Naftogaz reform, which I think is quite important, the corporate governance reform. It's been such a backwards and forwards reform, but it's in there, it's sticking, and I think it's a model for other reform from the state enterprise sector. The other is the work we've been doing with the European Union's help on putting in these reform support teams into the ministries to drive implementation policy. I think very, very important indeed. Now, as good friends, I want to tell the story both of the successes, but also, I'm always a man, whether it's glass half full, half, it's never, not empty, certainly. <laughs> Wherever we are with the liquid in the glass, 
there's always more to do. Because we want, quite rightly, to move even further up the league table of doing business survey, we want to get to the Foreign Investment <coughs> Council with successes on here. This is going to be a very good little pamphlet, I'm sure, but we've got more to do. So let me say a about a few things that I really think we should be doing. And this is based on, if you like, the last four years, which for me is what I call the new Ukraine, new Ukraine where we've invested 3.5 billion euros, a huge number of projects, three quarters of a billion just last year, uh, again. I think this is really, for us, the EBRD scorecard of where we are and what more needs to be done. And I look at, look at it through six lenses. Resilience, competitiveness, the green agenda, inclusion, integration, and governance. Those are the six lenses. Now, we're promoting all of these uh, re all of these qualities, and we do so very much from a strong believer in the country, its people, and its potential going forward. And I want to stress that actually we'd like to do even more business in Ukraine. Ukraine is currently our third <coughs> largest market. Turkey number one, Egypt number two, then Ukraine. In our view, Ukraine has a potential to go much, much higher in that league as well. So let me start with resilience. I don't think Ukraine gets enough credit, and I've said this publicly a number of times, for the financial sector cleanup that has been taking place. Do you remember how many banks there used to be in Ukraine a few years ago? I think something like in the 180s. Even more. And it was, the Ukrainian economy was one seventh the size of Turkey, and the Turkish economy had 49 banks. This was ridiculous. These were largely slot, you know, ATMs for oligarchs, as far as I can make out many of them. That cleanup <laughs> took courage, took resilience, and I think it's made a major difference. Consolidation, recapitalization have really helped, I think. And in that regard, I think the partnership between the Ministry of Finance and the Central Bank has been crucial in taking that forward. And I want to pay tribute to them as well. The energy sector also, in terms of resilience, I think it's benefited from the diversification of gas imports, reforms that you've taken place, you took some early reforms on the pricing, which no one expected actually. And I think it's still a work in progress, but I think <coughs> this evening that even further price uh, changes will take place. And that's really important for resilience of the economy. Competitiveness, well I think the Doing Business Survey numbers show that. We've seen great progress on that. I think we'd see more progress, and this is a, an agenda that we have as a joint agenda, if uh, state-owned enterprises had less of a grip on the economy that we put more of the economy into private hands, if the business climate was even more robust in the areas where the Doing Business Survey suggests some more action is required, and, very important, and I think Ukraine can do this pretty quickly, if productivity and innovation was even higher. The country has one of the fastest rising IT sectors, for a start, and you can see the creativity and innovation in that sector. Some of it needs to be transferred more into some of the more traditional sectors, I think, on manufacturing and so on some of those skills updates mm -hmm. that we're seeing in the IT sector. On green, you know, we uh, in EBID, we're very proud of this because we set a, ourselves a, a target across all our countries of getting 40% of our investments in the green, air, green economy by 2020. Mm -hmm. We got to 43% by the end of last year, three years early. And we wouldn't have got there without some of the work that we did in Ukraine. So it continues to be, of course, one of the world's most energy intensive countries three times more so than the EU average. So really, we've got to now move, make an even bigger push, I think, on energy efficiency with you. I think diversifying energy sources, and this is the big one, I think, municipal services, municipal infrastructure. Really working with municipalities at sub-sovereign, at the sub-sovereign level, to change their approach to energy efficiency as well. And we've received, received a lot of donor funding for this. The E5P fund uh, provided close to 110 million euros in grants to renovate uh, inefficient district heating systems. But the investments we need uh, really need to be combined with necessary reforms still in this sector. So this is an area where I would urge the Ukrainian ministries to help with the implementation of reforms. It's not that you don't know what reforms to take, you're already doing them. It's implementation capacity, I think, that's a big issue. Now, here's one that I really care deeply about, and I think this is one where Ukraine in the new Ukraine, in the next few years, we focus on it's inclusion, inclusion agenda. Private sector growth in Ukraine has returned, great news, but it's still hampered by gender gaps at the workplace, in access to finance, 
uh, as well as by the uneven distribution of skills across the economy. I really want to hear to commend and congratulate the Health Ministry for the recent steps it took to remove discriminatory practices uh, in hiring women. Uh, it abolished the famous order number 256, which banned women from being employed in, I think, something like 450 professions. That's fantastic. That's a great start. But for larger, more systemic uh, change to occur, it's going to have to happen. Ukraine, I think, does need to build up this pipeline of women with technical qualifications. It's a fantastic education system, but we're underutilizing half the population's talent, is the basic point I want to get across. And I think this is really important, particularly in the high-value sectors, where the women are underrepresented. We need to improve workplace flexibility, and this is something we want to work on with, with you, but to accommodate women entering uh, either marriage and motherhood, to make it easier to come in and out of work. And again, learning from some of the other countries, strengthen access to finance and entrepreneurship skills for female business people as well. This is really important for And I want to I, I say in the next phase, country strategies coming up, this has got to be something that if you only helps Ukraine with that this agenda as well. Integration, the president said it, infrastructure <laughs> investment is an absolute priority uh, in this country. I think uh, both old and new need really focusing on, on. So I won't say much more, simply to catch up with regional neighbors, actually, and to integrate you more with the European economy as well. So let me come to the last of these six uh, transition qualities, which is governance. And I'm going to talk quite frankly about this, because this is an area where there's been some progress, but there's also been lots of challenges still to overcome as well. And I, I think we have to start here with something that I say frankly to my friend Petra, that life is unfair. I said this just a few minutes ago to him, that actually there's always a time lag before the community out there, the community which doesn't follow Ukraine day to day like I do, doesn't go up and down that road from the airport into the city, their attention span is much shorter than, than others. So they need this constant updating of what you've done, but they also need timelines for what you plan to do. And these need to be set out, particularly before we have the fifth meeting, I think. The recent survey of foreign investors showed exactly the problem. So there we are, doing business survey, league table, Ukraine shooting up. What do these foreign investors say? Well, understand we still talk about corruption. And they still talk about a lack of trust on the judiciary in Ukraine as the main barriers to FDI. And we've got to show them how that's changing, what you're doing to change that. And we want to work with you on that as well. I think the level of trust in institutions in Ukraine is, is still too low, despite those doing business survey uh, indicators. And I think despite, this is despite great efforts made by my friends in the government and the president, really the real reformers, who have done so much with the backup of the international community to try and show that institutions are improving. And I mentioned that after that, corporate governance code has been absolutely crucial for this. So I, th I think that is an area that I would really, really want to push very hard in the next phase. I think the establishment of a credible and independent anti-corruption institution uh, is going to be very, very important, obviously, in improving Ukraine's economic prospects and in delivering sort of transparency, the accountability that people want to see. And I'm here, I'm very proud of BBRD's financing of the Business Ombudsman Institution. That has made a major difference, I think, to the relationship between state and private sector. Uh, I think it's been very good. I think the proposal to create this uh, anti-corruption court uh, is a very good one. It's a very positive step in the right direction. And we need now to get this through. Uh, and we're very supportive of you, I think, in putting this through uh, the RADA and, and on. And implemented. And we, of course, uh, Alexander and I debate this every time we meet, which is about public administration capability and capacity to deliver. We can't carry on with a set of brilliant reformers at the top, you know, at the apex of the system. And then you take a decision, and then uh, it takes a long time to get it actually through. And people don't want to take responsibility, don't want to be accountable. And that's the sort of incentive system that's got to change, I think, in Ukraine. Uh, to really do that. So all of that, I think, those are some of the things I think that we would want to see. I think Ukraine is at this very in important juncture now. Four years of a reforming uh, push to show the new Ukraine. I know the president, the government, understand the importance of this governance agenda to really solidify this change. 
And I actually believe in their commitment to this agenda, to better governance. And by the way, in many countries, and you know, I used to be a civil servant in the UK, we often used to think the year before an election was a dead year, where governments didn't really want to do very much because they would actually have to touch vested interests. And so they would avoid action. Uh, I think this is completely wrong. I think this is the year, actually, to show that taking on some of the vested interests, taking on these blockages, is politically popular, actually, as we've seen in many other emerging markets. It's tough. It requires a lot of courage. But then you've got that courage. You've shown it, you and your team. So this is the year, I think, 2018, as you head towards elections next year, when we will certainly be standing with you with showing that actually better governance can be politically popular thing to do. And it's actually a vote winner. So ladies and gentlemen, I, you know, I have spent a lot of my five and a half years pledging support for Ukraine and its people. I did so at the London conference, convened to support reforms last year. I did so at the YES conference in Kiev in the autumn. Uh, I'm doing so again here today in Davos. Uh, you know, while I also have some concerns about things that need to, that we need to move on together as well. Ultimately, EBRD can only be a facilitator, can only be a partner. We rightly, you know, this is your nation, not ours. This is, you, you must be sovereign, and you must take these decisions. We can only advise you, and our job is to showcase successes and failures, challenges, what worked elsewhere, and what you can take on. But I think acceleration now is required, and will deliver the investment uh, changes that you want to see, the FDI flowing in, in the way it should. And our job, frankly, is to support the leadership that you're showing. That's what Ukraine needs. It's a leadership Ukraine deserves. And I know, Mr. President, that with you and your team, I think you're going to do your utmost to show that leadership throughout this year, coming 18 months through to the elections. It's very important. What's our job? Can you do to support you to the utmost in this very important endeavor, to be the frank friend and the financier and the help of implementation as well. And I believe that we've done that together, really shown that modernization, reform and change can happen in this great country. And I think there's more of it to come with you and your team and with us supporting you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sir Sima, for those enlightening comments. I'd like to give President Poroshenko an opportunity to address any further um, comments that he has following Sir Sima's uh, keynote. At the same time, I'm, I'm, I'm inspired to tell you, because with the inclusion comment, I'm inspired to tell everyone that when we look at the organizers of Ukraine House, six out of seven are women. So we have, we have almost, <laughs> we have an organization committee that is predominantly women and frankly speaking, <laughs> I can appreciate that, uh, that our chairman of UBCA, Andriy Kolodjuk, <laughs> is on the receiving end of <laughs> gender inequality. I also, I That's also why this was organized so well. <laughs> And, <laughs> and, and gentlemen, I, I want to emphasize that we are making history this year. This is the first ever Ukraine House. For those of us, for those of us who were here last year, who came to the Ukraine, Ukrainian Davos Nights, we had two events, two <coughs> evening events, that were three times oversubscribed in terms of interest. And that really motivated us to take a leap forward and to have the first ever Ukraine House. And we look forward to expanding it in future years. We thank everyone for the support. And we believe that history has been made this year and will continue to be made. So you're part of history tonight. And as a result, the number of uh, interesting person come from Ukraine is tripled. Mm -hmm. And the number of uh, visitors was 15 times bigger than previous time. Can you imagine one small step, even someone in one, this small room, they bring such a big portion of the real information. Sorry about that, but this is also very effective. 
how to contradict, how to protect against fake news, which was delivered by a Russian television and Russian hybrid war condition. This is the direct way how to deliver direct and truthful <laughs> information about Ukraine and the opportunities and their possibility. We can give very uh, encouraging examples. Everybody knows that uh, Elon Musk uh, launching their Space 10 or SpaceX, sorry, uh, uh, missile rocket. But nobody knows that the these spare parts for these big spare parts for these missiles was delivering by Ukrainian plane Antono 124 Ruslan. And without Ruslan, this is not possible. This is role of Ukraine. Maybe nobody uh, or very few people knows about the role of Ukraine, but this is still has a great, great <coughs> importance. So again, I want to thank all of you, and uh, maybe we can move yes. to the Q&A session. Wonderful. Okay. So at this point, um, please turn off the cameras, because we do want to give investors an opportunity to, to ask questions off the record.